Apple just introduced one of the coolest new features with iOS 18 and macOS Sequoia, iPhone mirroring. And it's hands down one of the coolest features to come out of their WWDC event in June. Now here's why I love iPhone mirroring so much and you probably will too. Even though it's still in beta, it works really well and I use it almost every day. You can now access your iPhone remotely from your Mac, whether it's checking on notifications, opening apps, or even playing games, it's all possible without having your iPhone in hand or even in the same room. Now, before you try iPhone mirroring on a Mac yourself, there are a couple things that you'll want to keep in mind. First, you need to have one of the following Macs that supports macOS Sequoia, and you need to have one of the following iPhones that supports installing iOS 18. Now, with both betas installed, here's how to set up iPhone mirroring on your Mac. Both devices need to be logged in with the same Apple ID, have Bluetooth enabled, and be on the same Wi-Fi network. Now with your iPhone and Mac nearby, you should see an icon for iPhone mirroring in your dock. It'll look like this. Click it. Click continue. And then on your iPhone, unlock it. Back on your Mac, click get started. And if it's a Mac you trust, you can click authenticate automatically. That way when you go to connect, you don't have to go through that step each time. Another really cool thing, and for security purposes, you're notified on your iPhone anytime your Mac is mirroring your screen. And even after you unlock your phone, you'll get a notification at the very top that your iPhone was used previously. To make the most of your iPhone mirroring experience, here are a couple quick tips for navigating the UI a little bit more intuitively. One of the most obvious is when you're in an app, you can quickly access your phone screen by clicking the white or black bar at the bottom, working just like it would on an actual iPhone. To access our spotlight search, we can either click right here, okay, obvious, or we can swipe with two fingers up to access it as well. Similarly, using our two finger gestures, we can swipe between our different home screens to access, for example, our app library, or to get to our widgets on the left-hand side, and then use our scrolling as we normally would within the iPhone mirroring screen. And it works really well, making it feel like it really is a native experience on our Mac. But if you're like me and you prefer keyboard shortcuts, using Command-1, we can access our home screen. Command-2 opens our app switcher. And then Command-3 is yet another way to access Spotlight Search. And then finally, if you move your Mac cursor just above the window for iPhone mirroring, in addition to minimizing or closing out the app, we have two other shortcuts. This one is another way to access our app switcher, and that one is another way to get back to the home screen quickly. For most users, I think they'll probably be using gestures or the commands, but that option is there as well. That said, as cool and handy as iPhone mirroring already is, and it's probably gonna get better, there are a few limitations. The first thing that you'll probably notice is that you can't use your iPhone simultaneously while mirroring. So we go to try and unlock our iPhone. Automatically, it's gonna say iPhone is in use and that mirroring has ended because of that. So we need to lock our iPhone again, hit try again, and then our Mac will reconnect. And even though it's quick to resume on your Mac once your iPhone is locked, this limitation is put in place so you don't have two different inputs competing with each other. That said, I did notice a couple interesting things. Even with mirroring enabled, you can still actually interact with your lock screen. All your widgets, all your notifications. The only thing is, once you swipe up, it's going to end the mirroring session. That said, something that's actually interesting is when your iPhone is charging in in its horizontal standby mode, you can still interact with its different screens. The only limitation I've found, however, is that when you go to interact with, say, your to-do schedule, it will prompt your Face ID in order to verify that, in which case your iPhone session needs to resume once again, but aside from that, you still have a lot of functionality on the lock screen itself. Now, another really cool thing that I found is that with mirrored apps, for example, music, all audio is going to be actually played through your Mac, which is super awesome. And as someone who isn't the biggest fan of the native Apple Music app on Mac, I actually find myself using this a lot. The only limitation though, is that aside from your volume controls, pause, play, and next don't work. Having those extra shortcuts would have been a nice touch, and maybe we'll see them in a future update. But speaking of streaming, apps like Hulu, although you can load up the app, and it looks like you're about to play the video, won't actually stream the content. I find this one a little bit interesting as you can airplay content to different devices like your TVs and other smart displays, 
but when it comes to actually mirroring the content, protected streaming videos from apps like Hulu and Netflix will not work. Additionally, any app or game, for example, Heads Up that uses the accelerometer will not work. Obviously, you need to be able to flip down your phone in order to change the card, and that's not an option here. And speaking of things that don't work when mirroring, you can't access your iPhone's microphone or its camera. So if you want to, you're gonna to need to take your photo or video while disconnected and then reconnect to the mirroring session in order to access those files. And then on the topic of files, transferring files between your two devices natively was something that Apple demoed at their latest event, but it hasn't made its way to one of these releases. For example, if I wanna drag this screenshot from my iPhone in the files app to my desktop, I can't do that. And then finally, you can't switch between portrait and landscape modes. Certain games that run natively in landscape, for example, Civ 5, will load and rotate the display. But for example, when I try to load up the Photos app, and let's say this is a nice landscape photo that I want to view in landscape, there's no way currently to do that. Hopefully that's something we could see from a future update, but there's no word on that yet. Now, of course, your experience is going to vary depending on the app, especially ones designed for touch or accelerometer inputs aren't always going to translate that well on a Mac with mouse and keyboard. I also did notice that there's a fair bit of input delay between what I'm doing on my mouse and keyboard and what's actually happening on screen, so it's probably not the best choice for intense gaming. Also, and this is probably heavily dependent on your network connection, it's not the sharpest resolution at all times. Sometimes things do look a little bit blurry. But still, as a beta feature, it's impressively smooth, and it's another example of why Apple's ecosystem is so strong. And even though Android has had similar features in the past, Apple's implementation here just feels more refined and polished, and I'm excited to see how well this improves by the time it's officially released. But of course, as a beta, there's still a lot that Apple can and hopefully is working on. Supporting rotating displays and more native keyboard shortcuts would be at the top of my list. And of course, I can't wait to try the native file transfer once it's released later this year. But let me know what you think. What's your favorite feature? For more cool tech, you can follow us everywhere at Tom's Guide, and you can check me out to see what I'm reviewing next. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.